Growing up as a kid, I loved watching shows about space. Maybe you did too. One of my favorites was Star Trek. I dreamed of searching for aliens elsewhere in the solar system and looking for the origins of life down here on Earth. And I remember one day at university, I was studying for an exam I was definitely not prepared for, so I went to go get a coffee because I knew I'd be staying up all night studying. I decided to take a slight detour though through the engineering precinct because as a science student, I had never been there before and I heard that they had better coffee. But on that walk, I found something much better than a good coffee. I came across a flyer about a group of students building a Mars rover as part of a robotics competition in the United States. They were looking for an astrobiologist, someone who looks for life out in space. And I thought to myself, wow, this is amazing. What are the chances? This is exactly what I want to do. So I signed up right there. Now, when I joined the team, this was the rover. It was a metal box. It wasn't much, but from that metal box, we built our first prototype. It was made using aluminium and door hinges we brought from Bunnings and wheelbarrow wheels we scavenged from the backyard. It could only turn left and its wheels kept falling off. But that didn't stop us. We continued to build and innovate and soon created our final rover, which we called Sandstorm. We then took Sandstorm with us overseas to the University Rover Challenge where we represented Australia for the first time. Now we couldn't afford to send Sandstorm overseas as freight, so we decided to disassemble it and then pack it into our suitcases. We then went all the way through American airport security with our suitcases full of metal and wires. Now that's a journey I will certainly never forget. Now from these experiences, I was lucky enough to go visit NASA Ames to work on one of their Mars rovers as part of a simulated mission in the Atacama Desert. But looking back, all these sequences of events stem from a simple decision to take a detour when walking to get a coffee. Now, I want you to think about a moment in your life where you took a detour. Maybe it was a slightly different path from what you were planning or a surprise roadblock which stopped you from doing something entirely. Now, these detours in our lives, they can be frustrating, they can be exciting, they can be meaningless, or they can be life-defining. And today, I'm here to talk to you about detours in space. About a detour that some of us or our children may make in the not-so-distant future as NASA has planned to send humans onwards to Mars and to use the moon as a stepping stone to get there. To achieve this journey, they're planning to launch the Lunar Gateway in 2024 to serve as an orbiting outpost for human missions to the moon and a staging grounds for refueling spacecraft before their journey to Mars. And the goal? Establishing an interplanetary human presence. Now you might be thinking, Daniel, hold on. Why should I care about space in the first place. Isn't space just for billionaires riding their own rockets or for NASA to go look at dirt on other planets? No, space is much more than that. In the words of Captain Jean-Luc Picard in Star Trek, space is the final frontier. And if you were to ask me why explore space, I would ask you why explore? Because as humans we're innately curious about the world around us. It's the reason why we choose to explore the world or to take detours in the first place. Now, some of the most curious people I've ever met are kids. They take every opportunity to explore the world around them and they ask the best questions. They simply ask, why? Why is the sky blue? Why is the sunset red? Why do stars twinkle? And ultimately, this is what my talk is all about. It's about being curious. Now, some of you may be fascinated by space and others not so much. And if that's you, I hope by the end of this talk, you'll be feeling just a little bit more curious. Now, space is much more than a frontier for exploration or a playground for curiosity. It's a catalyst for developing new technologies that benefit us down here on Earth. And I could list the countless innovations in health, medicine, communications, material science, transport, but I want you to look down at your feet. Chances are, if you're wearing some air cushion soles in your shoes, they were made using a technique called blow rubber molding. Now this technique was originally made to create shock absorbing materials in spacesuit helmets. And then an engineer called Frank Rudy pitched it to Nike and we got Nike Airs. So I like to think when Neil Armstrong took his first small step, it really was one giant leap for mankind. Now, if you woke up this morning and you burnt your toast and the fire alarm started going off, you can thank space for that lovely noise. 
because modern day smoke alarms were made to detect fires and toxic gases in Space Lab, which was America's first space station. If you then grabbed a cordless vacuum cleaner to clean up those crumbs of burnt toast, then you just grabbed a piece of technology that helped Apollo astronauts collect soil samples on the moon. Their equipment had to be small, lightweight, but most importantly, battery powered. Maybe you then grabbed a cool glass of water to chill out. Well, you'd be chilling like an astronaut because up on the International Space Station, all water has to be filtered, purified and recycled. What does this mean? Well, all water has to be filtered, purified and recycled, even their urine. So as the saying goes, the coffee you drink today is the coffee you'll drink tomorrow. Now you might be thinking, okay, space is kind of cool, but why should I care about the moon? Haven't we already been there a few times? Yes, but we've just scratched the surface, literally. If you were an alien species and you landed at six different points around the equator, dug a few two meter holes into the ground, could you confidently say that you knew that everything there was to know about the earth? Well, this is how much we've explored the moon. In comparison, we've been studying the earth for tens of thousands of years, dug kilometers into the ground, and we still have so many unanswered questions. One of those questions is the origin and evolution of life on Earth. Now, liquid water is an essential ingredient for all life, but exactly how and when Earth got its oceans are not entirely clear. An answer to this question could lie up on the moon. We think that the icy comets, which contain a large amount of water, slammed into the early Earth, giving us some of our, o some of our oceans. These same comets would have slammed into the moon as well. But if you look at the moon, there's no oceans, there's no rivers, and in the soils we brought back, they were drier than the driest soils we have on Earth. So, where's all the water? It's up at a dark place that even the sun doesn't shine. Unlike the Earth, the moon rotates perpendicularly on its axis. This means that light from the sun grazes across the top and bottom of the poles. So, if a meteor ever creates an impact crater up at the pole, it creates a crater that light can never directly enter. We call these regions persistently shadowed regions, or PSRs. Now what do you think happens to a place that doesn't receive sunlight for billions of years? It gets cold. Really cold. So cold, in fact, that we've recorded the coldest surface temperature in our solar system in a PSR on the moon. It was about 25 degrees above absolute zero, or minus 250 degrees centigrade. Now, why is this important? Because any water that enters a PSR becomes permanently trapped because the, mo the molecules are moving so slowly because it's so cold. This means that as water accumulates and builds up, there could be a several billion year old history of ice delivery to the moon. This means that by studying the moon, we can learn more about the origins and evolution of Earth's oceans and even possibly life. Now this is where my PhD research comes in. I'm interested in finding out how much water there is, where it is, and what are its properties. Now, we've never visited a PSR before or collected any samples, so this makes my job really difficult, but also really exciting. Now, the moon means a lot of different things to different people. What does it mean to you? It could mark the beginning of a new lunar year and for celebration, or it could just illuminate the sky as you drive home at night. For me, the moon is a gateway to the rest of our solar system. It's a hub for bold new scientific discoveries and knowledge. Knowledge, which I hope to contribute to over the next few years. Now, why should you care about water on the moon though? Because water is essential for keeping humans alive in space. We drink it, we use it to grow crops, we can split it into oxygen and hydrogen to breathe, and we can even use it for rocket fuel. If we can learn to use the water we collect from PSRs on the moon, then we can keep astronauts alive in space for longer. This removes the need for heavy and expensive resupply missions from the Earth, and is all part of NASA's dream to live off the land, to use the resources we find in space to keep astronauts alive for longer and to explore further than we ever have before, eventually to Mars. But before we go to Mars, we need to demonstrate that astronauts can collect their own water grow their own food and create their own air. And to do this, we need to demonstrate that it works on the moon first. This is why the moon is important. It's more than a rock we visited in the 70s. 
It's a sand pit where we can develop new technologies that benefit us on Earth. It's a library where we can study the origins and evolution of Earth's oceans and possibly even life. It's not just a detour on the journey to Mars to refuel, it's an essential stepping stone in our journey to get there. So, what does this all mean? Why should you care? How does space, the moon or Mars relate to your life? Because right now, you're living through the fourth industrial revolution of the world. There is already an estimated demand of about 500 metric tons of water to be collected from the moon. This will generate about $2.4 billion of revenue annually. This demand stems from refueling spacecraft and satellites, astronauts living on the Lunar Gateway and on the moon, space agriculture, and space tourism. Now this all sounds amazing, but why can't we check into a space hotel right now? Because moving things in space is expensive. In lunar orbit, one liter of water costs about $36,000 if it's sent from Earth. But if we can collect one liter of water from a PSR on the moon, it would only cost about $500. Because water can be used for so many different things, its access to cheap water underpins the future of space travel. But the biggest thing holding us back right now is that we can only get water from the Earth. So, if we can learn to use water from the moon, things become cheaper. When things are cheap and there's a demand, then there's an economy. Now, the space sector is currently worth about $450 billion, and it's poised to explode to several trillion dollars by 2040. And to try and capture this lightning in a bottle, the Australian Space Agency released a report back in 2019 outlining their intentions to triple the size of the space sector and to grow 20,000 additional jobs. All these jobs won't be up in space though, most will be down on Earth. Now, whatever it is that excites you about space, I want you to imagine yourself in 10 or 20 years. Imagine yourself as humans are setting foot on Mars and establishing bases on the moon. Where are you? Are you in Australia? Are you overseas? Are you on the moon or are you even on Mars? What are you doing? It could be similar to what you're doing right now or something entirely different. It was not so long ago that jobs like project manager or data analyst didn't exist. So I like to think the jobs that will be working in the future don't exist yet. Who else are you working with? Because no single company or nation can build a global space sector on their own. And this is why we need people from every background and every discipline to help us get into space and to stay there safely. Now, this is why I'm excited about space and going to the moon. I'm curious to explore the world around me and to see the, where the next detour in my life will take me. And I'm excited to share that passion with space with others and help you connect to space. So I invite you all to reclaim your childhood curiosity, to always ask why, to be willing to explore new paths and to take detours, to think about what space the moon and Mars means to you. Now, some of you might find yourself taking a detour in your life, working in a role you never planned for in an industry that you didn't know existed. And you never know, it just might happen the next time you go get a coffee. Thank you.